the Hope Pregnancy Center project that we're launching. And then after that, Ashley's gonna field Q&A for all the speakers. Uh, well, Dean, uh, welcome uh, on to our meeting. Uh, welcome and greetings from the UK to New Jersey. Welcome. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dean. It's great to see you. It's great to see you, my brother. Now, where are you? You're calling from your, uh, are you from home or are you in your uh, pregnancy center itself? I'm in the pregnancy center in Union, New Jersey. Great. And you're still operational. I mean, you're right in the hot spot of COVID-19. Am I right? Absolutely. We're wearing masks in the office. Uh, New Jersey is number two in the nation uh, in terms of the number of cases and the number of deaths, unfortunately. Wow. So we are in the hot spot. Okay, wow. And also, if I'm not mistaken, something of a hot spot for abortion as well. I mean, New York and the surrounding area, I think, is something of an abortion uh, epicenter, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dean, look, I don't want to take any more of your time. So I'm going to hand straight over to you. We're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you for all the ways you've blessed us already on your virtual trip to the UK. And we're uh, full of anticipation for what, in God's grace, you're going to be bringing now and over the next few weeks and months. And we are hoping for a, a, a real life um, in-person visit, perhaps in the autumn uh, or the fall, as my uh, Google Translate says, uh, I should say to you. Thank you, Dean. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, I was going to begin with a presentation, but before I do that, I think it's very important to address what Vaughn said, what Laura said, in terms of abortion. I'm all the way from America. I'm not in England, and I do not know the churches in England, but I do know a bit about the churches in America. We've been involved in pregnancy center work for nearly 40 years, and I've been directing a pregnancy center for 34 years. And what I've seen mirrors what Laura said. The statements she made are so powerful. And this morning, as I go through a presentation, uh, I'd like to begin with a, it's not really a disclaimer, but it's to tell you where I'm at. Uh, I believe that hurting people need the truth. Uh, we're speaking to different audiences. I'm presuming that many of the people listening in are church leaders or pastors or go to a church in which they may engage the pastor in a discussion about abortion. I believe what Vaughn said is so necessary. We need to engage the clergy. Uh, I do believe that what we heard from Laura was pro profound. Laura speaks for the 37,000 people that we have seen at Gateway. We need to expose abortion. We need to speak with love, with compassion, yes, with clarity, but with conviction, especially to the clergy. When I was ordained, there was a doctrinal statement, and a number of those doctrines had to do with the sanctity of life, had to do with the incarnation, had to do with the person of Jesus Christ. So when Laura says this is a biblical doctrinal discussion, it is. We cannot allow women to suffer in silence. There are many women that their church does not speak on abortion. We speak about everything else. We speak with passion and conviction and clarity and with wisdom and we listen. And yet this is the one subject that we don't speak about. I believe, and I said it the other day, I believe that is the work of Satan who has blinded our eyes and convinced us for many reasons that this is something we can't talk about. Salvation and the life of the unborn child are two subjects, and the subject of hell and repentance are also subjects that many pastors, and I speak as a pastor, many pastors, even here in America, they regrettably put in the background. Women need healing, but healing begins 
with truth. I liked what Vaughn said, if we never go there, we're not pastoring. We are to preach the word. And yes, like the Apostle Paul, we speak to different groups. We become all things to all people in order that we may win some. This morning or this afternoon there in Britain, I'm asking you to hear for your pastor, if you are a church leader, hear this presentation looking at what the scripture says and looking at what the pastor's role is. And then I'd ask you to join in the work of CBR UK. Greg Cunningham, CBR in America, is a good friend. He said this, people don't merely need to be told the truth. They need to be convinced to embrace it. When we speak to women who have aborted or are thinking of abortion, they're not interested in politics. They're not interested in apologetics but they are open to hearing the truth and they want to know the truth. And so many people I know, hundreds, have the same testimony as Laura. Nobody told them. And when we do that, we allow people to sit in silence. So allow me to begin. Abortion is a gospel issue. If we don't see it as a gospel issue, we will miss it. We will see it as a political issue. We'll see it as a social issue. And the church will continue as it has in America for the last 38 years. And in your country, I believe it's 43 years. Abortion is an issue that affects 40% of people who go to evangelical churches. There is no doubt that people that are in your church, many of them are sitting in silence, they've had an abortion, or they've had someone very close to them who has had an abortion. So what is a gospel-centered, direct approach crisis pregnancy center? I'd like Kurt Young to explain for, uh, for us, because Kurt began the Pregnancy Center ministry here in America, and he began with the gospel being central. Uh, but before we hear from Kurt, this is a brief promo video that we put together about seven, eight years ago. And basically, it will tell you the heart of Gateway Pregnancy Center. And my desire, as I associate with uh, the group at Hope, is that they too see the gospel centrality and the direct approach as the key way to win souls to Christ, to save babies, and to live faithfully for the Lord. Gateway began about 25 years ago. It began as Archway Pregnancy Center in Elizabeth. In 2008, we opened a facility in Plainfield, New Jersey. So we now have three facilities, and we're even looking to Newark as well. We have just common folks from age 17 counseling with us to age 92 folding our baby clothes. For us, we have a dual purpose. Our first purpose is to reconnect people who know Christ and those that don't know Christ, they need to know Christ. If a person is pro-life but doesn't have eternal life, what importance is that? so many pro-life people, but there's so few that know Christ. We see pregnant women and men who care about their children, they care about each other, but they've never heard the gospel. We care for both. Unlike some pregnancy centers, we believe a child is very critical, uh, made in the image of God. Our focus is on the Christian mission. People are disconnected with the God that made them. Pregnancy test. 
Jesus or a sonogram or the abstinence message, but the message is Christ. The method is the pro-life movement. The message is greater than the method. How long will we be doing it? As long as people need Christ, and that means until the second coming, we're going to be sharing Christ. I think you know, and the church knows, that Jesus is the only way to salvation. People are separated from God because of their sin. How we express that to them is so important, and it allows us to get a hearing. There needs to be gentleness. There needs to be compassion. There needs to be mercy. And yet there needs to be truth. We need to be able to speak the truth in love. We already have the answers in Scripture. We already have the motivating power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to speak the truth. All we need to do to stop fearing and do it. By now, the church knows these facts. Heartbeat at 18 days after conception. The brainwave, 41 days after conception. So the church knows that abortion begins at about the sixth week or so, sometimes earlier with medical abortions. That means by the sixth week, abortion is stopping a beating heart and ending a brainwave. Many pastors know the following verses, and often they include them in their sermons. They know about the personhood of uh, the unborn child in the womb. They know that life begins at conception. They're very familiar with Psalm 139. They often quote Luke 1 and 2, especially around Christmas. They know about death in the womb. They comfort those who are dying. They know the 23rd Psalm. They know the uh, life of Job and the formation of life within the womb. There is nothing more important for pastors to do than to handle accurately the word of truth. The Bible speaks with clarity and it speaks with authority on the sanctity of life. As a fellow pastor, pastors will be held accountable for what they say and what they refuse to say, for what they do and for what they refuse to do. These pastors often know Exodus 21. And if you don't know that passage, that's often been used to promote abortion. But within the last 35 years, the one who did the exegesis on this passage changed his view because he went back into the Hebrew and saw that not only is this passage not speaking about abortion, but it is speaking about the equality of the unborn child. Two men fighting. A pregnant woman gets in the middle. She is with twins in the Hebrew, and she gives birth prematurely. She doesn't have a miscarriage. There's no abortion here. And if there's a serious injury, the offender is fined, as the court and the husband demands. But if there is serious injury, then the penalty is life for life. Now, in the Hebrew, the serious injury refers to the unborn child and the mother. That close coupling in the Hebrew shows the equality of the unborn child with the mother. We often cringe when someone says, I'm entitled to the uh, right of my own body. This is not a body that we have. This is a body that God has given life beginning at conception. Kurt Young, who began the first Evangelical Pregnancy Center, put it correctly. And so did someone named John Piper, who 30 years later uh, just agreed with that. Abortion is an assault not only on the persons made in God's image, but on the God in whose image they are made. Piper calls it the ultimate evil. It assaults and demeans God. Now, step back and take a moment and ask yourself, from God's perspective, if something 
demeans him and assaults him and attacks him, is this not something that we need to repent of? It's an assault on God. Many pastors may know and even preach uh, many sermons, but they rarely preach about exceptions because many pastors are not familiar with the scripture and how it speaks about the life of the unborn child. Next week, we'll be doing some training and we're gonna dive into this, the birth defects. Is this an exception? Does God have two lists? Does he allow one child with spina bifida to be aborted? But if it is a healthy child, that child now is making entry and has uh, an ability to be kept. What about incest and rape? They're, they're difficult subjects, but what happens is the rape victim, the victim of incest, is again a, a victimized when she aborts her child. And the one who is the aggressor usually walks away. And saving the life of the mother, we're not arguing that we are going to allow the mother to die. How you frame that argument really clearly shows where your answer is going to be. The argument's been framed. Surely we need to abort the child to save the mother's life. Well, if you ask the pro-abortionists, they will tell you that there's never that reality where a mother's life is needing an abortion to save her life. What I believe Glenn said at the beginning was true, that often a life is in danger, in peril, but you try to save both lives. And if the child's life is uh, forfeited, dies, perishes, that's not an abortion. When we talk about abortion, we're talking about an aggressive, invasive attack on a woman's body. But how we frame that question is how we're going to get an answer. 2% of all abortions are for rape, incest, or save the life of the mother, but it's a wonderful entryway for someone who's not thinking through the scripture to uh, fall into that category. So in America, we have 33% of people believing that rape and incest and fetal abnormalities are reasons for abortion. How can we possibly fight a demonic evil like abortion when we don't even know the scripture and we don't recognize that God has made all children in his image? We are called to do great exploits, yet Satan exploits that. He appeals to us, and one of the ways he appeals is he reaches out to the pastor. And he says to the pastor that you need to be about the work of preaching the gospel. And we forget that the gospel is not within the four walls of a building. Perhaps now some of us are getting that message. It's been eight weeks since I've been in the four walls of a church. Yet the church, which is the believer, is in this world. And we have great opportunities to minister and still minister to men and women in crisis. Pastors who would never deny the basic truths of Scripture never speak on abortion. And the silence is deafening. I believe to people like Laura, it's very deafening. I understand there's a statement in your country that we need to combine a strong opposition to abortion with a recognition that there can be strictly limited conditions under which it is preferable as an alternative. And we're going to answer that in the upcoming training. I would direct you to the little child on the left. Uh, their parents are going to be our banquet speaker this fall. Lord willing, that little boy was born with spina bifida. He had an operation. He's doing fine. Thank you. On the right, we have Mighty Max. He was born at 22 weeks. In fact, the hospital didn't even want to treat him because they didn't want to give him medicine uh, for his lungs. 
So let me ask this question. According to some theologians in the UK, which one is morally preferable to destroy? A woman who deliberately destroys a fetus is answerable for death. Who said that? Basil the Great, one of the church fathers. Many pastors have read the church fathers. All who use abortifacients are homicides and will account for their abortions. Athenagoras said that. The early church knew that abortion was a gospel issue, and they spoke out against it. And I believe Satan has blinded many pastors and many people in the pew to believe that it is a political issue, that it's a social issue. Yes, it delves into that, but authoritatively, it is a biblical issue because the Bible throughout speaks on the sanctity of human life. Chris Ostom said, abortion is something even worse than murder. Ask any woman who is going through post-abortion grief, and she understands that she was involved in the killing of a child, and she needs healing. And let me stop here and say something that I've said a number of times. There is no sin that God will not forgive, because we have a loving God. We have a compassionate God. We have a caring God. We have a merciful God. We have a gracious God. And yet, we have people who do things that displease God. And often, they are the victims and have the consequences of their own sin. The earliest Christian writing, the Didache, said, you shall not slay a child by abortion. The Synod of Elvira went even farther in 305 AD. They said if you had an abortion or if you helped someone to have an abortion, you were going to be excommunicated from the church until your deathbed. So my question I often ask is, what about the person who will drive a person to get the abortion even though they don't want them to abort? Are they involved in the uh, guilt of that abortion? The fetus carried in the mother's womb is already a man. It's unnatural to destroy someone who hasn't seen life. Bonhoeffer said a great many reasons may lead to this action, abortion, and we've seen it. We see poverty. We see uh, singleness. Uh, we see abuse in the home. We see education. None of these alter the fact that it's the killing of a child. There is a great deception, and I believe that deception has allowed pastors to be muzzled. And I believe that we have been muzzled into tolerance, into accommodation, and into justification. You say, abortion? It's, it's just a social or political issue. Well, the church just should preach the gospel. Is not a part of that gospel the doctrine of man? is not part of that gospel, the caring of a person made in God's image. Laura was spot on when she said this, that women are suffering in silence, as many pastors in my country at least, are uh, not wanting to hurt their feelings, not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting someone to leave because there are some pro-choice people here. Instead of compassionately and lovingly and boldly and biblically sharing the truth. Have we forgotten this book? The Bible speaks of tolerance. What does God say? I set my face against the man and will cut him off among the people because he gave his seed to Molech. Molech worship, similar to what we do with abortion, it is a spiritual issue. Second Kings. Manasseh filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon. Later on, he did forgive him, and yet there were the consequences. The Bible does speak of innocent blood. Psalm 106, 35, they served their idols. They shed innocent blood. They mingled among the heathen, and the wrath of God kindled against his people. Yes, on May 21, we do need to repent. We need to repent of our silence. The Bible speaks on the punishment for destroying a child. 
where they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead to enlarge their borders. And what I add to that is in today's society, we do it to pad our pockets. At least some people do. Psalm 106, 37, the Bible speaks of sacrificing children to idols. That's how we have idolatry. The Bible speaks of children in the womb as God's gift. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. They're the fruit of the womb, and we attack the fruit of the womb, and we attack God. The Bible speaks of what God considers abomination. When we justify the wicked and we condemn the just, they're both what? An abomination to God. The Bible speaks of a national sin. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Right now, as we speak, when I finish this broadcast, I will put a mask on and go out into a world that is deathly afraid of a virus they can't see. The nations of the entire earth are suffering under a pandemic. And my question, and it, I'm not saying I'm correct, but could God be trying to get our attention? Perhaps COVID-19 is a wake-up call. We may be prepared to die, but the question is, what are we living for? And what are others willing to die for? Long before the government encouraged us, too many people had been wearing a mask. And it starts, I believe, with the clergy, the mask of, I can't speak on this issue. I have to uh, please the people in the church. Someone will be offended. I will hurt the woman who's had the abortion. After seeing thousands and thousands of women who've had abortions, the one thing they would look me in the eye and say is please tell the pastor to say something because I'm suffering in silence. The opportunity to reach an entire mission field for Christ is removed because of fear. I am thrilled that in the UK, the Hope Center is going to reach those people. We've seen 37,000 people in our 35 years. And we've seen probably 6,000 babies born that would not have been born. We've given out eight and a half tons of baby items, done a thousand sonograms, talked to probably a thousand boyfriends. But what I'm encouraged is that 4,500 people have made a profession of faith. Yes, some may have just prayed a prayer and they need follow-up, but they received a 45-minute counseling session. The scripture was open. They were placed a Bible in their hands. They were challenged to come to Christ. And I believe that many repented of their sin. We cannot have an indirect pregnancy center. That achieves very little for the women like Laura. What it does is it says that only when you get an abortion, will we share the gospel to you? The gospel is for all, and the gospel needs to be shared. There's no way I could walk into this building and see dozens of people for 45 minutes to an hour and not share the gospel with them. That is their greatest need. You may choose to look the other way, Wilberforce said, but you can never again say that you didn't know. And when people know, especially when they see graphic videos or when they're encountered by loving, caring, compassionate people who speak with clarity and with conviction, the Holy Spirit does something that I cannot explain. We have minimized the Holy Spirit. We have minimized the Word of God. We have muzzled the truth. And I believe that the folks at CBR UK are opening that up and allowing a different approach. I can assure you after a third of a century, that approach works. I won't go into detail, but I do come from a, a painful childhood. I do know what pain is. And I do know that there are pains that people are suffering in silence. 
and abortion is one of them. You just heard that this morning from Laura. Listen to Laura. Be strong, be disciplined. The pastor is told that. In pointing this out, you're a good servant of Jesus Christ. You're nurturing people in sound doctrine. The sanctity of life is sound doctrine. And we have that opportunity. It's a golden opportunity. It goes far beyond COVID-19. In America, it's one of the subjects that's on the lips of everyone and is discussed by everyone. There are open doors to discuss it. Yes, to engage in it, to engage privately and publicly. And again, the way we engage is important. We are not to offend people. We are to love people. We are to pray for people. We love and pray for the abortionists. We visited the abortionists. And yet, as we engage people, we need to engage them with the truth. Be strong, be disciplined, know the consequences. The disease of sin has eternal consequences. And what we've been practicing sometimes is spiritual distancing, where we share a part of the truth of the gospel, but we leave out some of it, like the consequences of it, or we leave it out as we speak to someone in the challenge for them to come to Christ, the challenge for them to repent. Jesus' last command was what? To stay in church? To get back to church after the lockdown? No, to go into the world. The pregnancy center goes into the community. It goes into the world. And that is a divine command. So why do so few Bible-believing pastors preach about uh, other things but refuse to preach about abortion? It's off limits. We can't talk about it. We're simply sharing Jesus. Could there be, and I believe there is, an underlying fear? The Bible tells us to be strong and focused, to be strong in God's grace, to be sober in what we do and do that work of an evangelist. Allow, please allow the Hope Center to assist your pastor as he does the work of evangelism, as you do the work of evangelism. So people are not just reformed but they're transformed. This is the exact work of evangelism. Those coming to Christ will be sent back to the local church, perhaps your church, and hopefully you'll help them grow and serve, and they'll come back as volunteers. We have seen that. We've seen generational blessing because the Bible was shared unapologetically. Five fears that pastors have. My congregation will think I'm political. I don't want to be pegged as a crazy right-wing conservative. I feel inadequate to address the issue. Really, Pastor? Really? You know the scripture. Many of you have a, a doctoral degrees from seminaries. You preach about many subjects, and yet this issue, the sanctity of life, is throughout the scripture. No. Abortion is not mentioned in scripture, but the sanctity of life is. The uh, issue of child killing and what God thinks of that, the preciousness of the unborn child. We often refer to Luke, the second chapter, uh, John the Baptist leaping in his mother's womb for joy, joy, a human emotion. He leapt while in his mother's womb. Who did he praise? Who did he recognize? He recognized the Lord Jesus Christ, who was seven days old. He was a zygote. If that's not a pro-life message, I don't know what is. And yet I've heard it preached, but not with that spin on it. I'm already overwhelmed. I can't preach because it's going to open the floodgates. I'll have a hundred Lauras coming to me. Well, praise God. Then maybe there are some things you need to put aside in your ministry because it may be your ministry and it's not God's ministry. I've had pastors tell me they're growing their church. The Bible tells us that the church is God's. It's not our possession. Or I'm afraid I'm going to alienate and drive women away. I equate that with fear. And fear cripples. And Satan attacks the pastor in many ways. Uh, morally, uh, I don't believe doctrinally, but sometimes 
but I believe fear is one of them. Here is the great evangelical disaster. Dr. Francis Schaeffer said that in 1984. He said that the world does not stand for truth. They've accommodated. The evangelical church is accommodated to the world spirit. We tell them what they want to hear, but not what they need to hear. Be careful, because in the last days, there will be terrible times. People will love themselves. They'll be boastful and proud and abusive. You know the passage. They have a form of godliness. They're filling the churches. In fact, people in America are crying to get back into the building. And I believe God has sent us out of the building into the world. Perhaps we're learning a lesson. Well, please keep it out of my church. It's not your church. Abortion is not to be silenced, that subject. Well, they often said in Deuteronomy to be guiltless, our hands have not shed this blood. Now, that's true. But one thing you have forgotten that you saw abortion. It's all around us. So we are not innocent. And then what is our response? To rescue, to speak out, to do justice. If you shut your ears to the cry of the poor, when we cry out, we will not be answered. Most pastors believe in the Great Commission, and I do too. All authority given to make disciples, teaching them to observe all things. All things includes how to live their life before God. Here's the key. The church is not empty. The church has been deployed into the world. The church in the UK has been deployed, I believe, for the Hope Pregnancy Center. Once they come into my church, I will tell them, Dean, no, that's not, that's not a, a command that we've been given. We've been given a command to go, to go make disciples they may never come into your church. 17% of the people that come to our pregnancy center are Christians, and yet they're doing things that are unbiblical because nobody wanted to tell them. They didn't want to offend them. We're offending them into abortion facilities, and as one Jewish pastor said, because people don't want to offend Jewish people by sharing the Messiah, this Jewish pastor said, we are allowing them and loving them straight to hell. And that's what we're doing. We're imprisoning people. There are hundreds and hundreds of Lauras that have come to Gateway. And my plea is don't allow another one to leave the building without sharing Christ with them, without telling them the truth. Kurt Young said this about the pregnancy center. Uh, in fact, I'm not even going to play it because of time, but basically he said, when you do not share the gospel, you are setting yourself up for failure. You are crippling the truth. You're binding the truth of God. And what you're doing is trying to reform lives, and you're in God's way, and you're not allowing God to transform those lives because the Son of Man came to do what? He came to seek and to save the lost. And the Bible tells us there's a real place called hell. So if lost lives matter to you, you may seriously wish to volunteer at the Hope Center. Now, Gateway for 35 years has thrived on the support of local pastors. And in fact, uh, I'm going to go through a number of them. Lutheran pastor uh, here, Evangelical Assembly of God, Baptist, missionary, uh, Baptist, uh, Grace and Peace Fellowship, Orthodox Presbyterian, uh, Japanese uh, Church, uh, here uh, another one, uh, Inner City Church, large 3,000 person church, again, uh, 500 to 1,000 people, tiny church, that's my pastor, 40 people, and yet a godly man who speaks on the truth, who prays, and who teaches us to serve him. A larger church in the neighborhood and a brand new church. And my pastor, who's retired, who served God for 40 years, and a local pastor in Elizabeth, and a bunch of pastors from Newark, New Jersey. And my former pastor, where I was ordained, and a pastor I speak often, and a pastor who's new to another 
church locally and a local pastor as well, whose congregant, whose uh, member has served us for 33 years. So what do they have in common? They are part of the solution. We can't do it without the church. So the question is, how are you building your church? Is your church being built uh, on uh, a production of building, a building program, or is it being built on the word of God? I'm going to turn it back over to Ashling and to Dave, but before we do, I'd like us to play a brief video that speaks about the Hope Pregnancy Center and why it's so important to have a missional, direct approach where scripture is used. So if you would, let's play that video. Sorry, there seems to be a sound issue. Um, Ivana, if you could have a go at um, making sure that you share computer sound when you share this, that would be excellent. Um, we, we're not getting any sound at the moment. we knew what was best for our lives in the choices we made. But now, rescued from the mess, what is your story? What is your song? Lifted out of the mud and mire, set on the solid ground of Christ our rock, singing praise to God, that many will see and fear and put their trust in him. We are a people of hope, because hope is a person. Jesus, our hope. Our hope overflows. What does hope look like? How do we do hope? The complexities of a broken world, the desperation of a friend. For all the answers we don't have, for all the things we can't make right, for all the promises we can't give, there is a deep cry in our hearts of hope. For the crazy now and for the unknown future and for the unending forever, for all these, we have hope. What's the cry of so many women after abortion? No one offered me any hope. Often driven by others, nearly always driven by fear. Many say abortion didn't erase the fact that I was a mother and that was my child. Many say abortion almost destroyed them too. The word of God and the reality of abortion convict us we must act. We won't wait until after abortion to offer hope. The world says abortion, adoption, parenting, whichever you think is right for you. And some Christians are saying the same thing. But can the Christian ever say or pretend that abortion could be the right thing for anyone? It's a time to affirm life. It's time for a fresh approach. It's time to stand firm on truth and offer hope. Hope is a new project of CBR UK. Hope is a revolution in pregnancy support. Hope is full of compassion for abortion-minded women and men. Hope is full of grace and truth. 
doing ministry, trust in Christ, our wonderful counsellor. What is love? The world says, follow your heart. The word of God says, you need a new heart to follow God, to love him with all of you and to love your neighbour as much as you. The spirit reveals our hearts. He doesn't condemn, but convicts. And the God of hope fills believing hearts with overflowing hope. Who loved you enough to share the gospel with you? Did Jesus meet you where you were? He's with the woman at the well. He's with the woman crying help. Hope isn't neutral. Hope is a person. Hope is Christ in the commitment of care and the choice for life. Hope is offering advice and support. Do you carry the Lord's heart? Do you love the word of God? Do you love women and their unborn facing the abortion crisis? Is yours a missionary heart of hope? Hope Pregnancy Centre is a lighthouse to offer hope in the storms of life. The word of God says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And Psalm 71 says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you have I leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you.